Hi guys, Pastor Matt Chandler here. Pray uh, that this sermon, this resource, uh, be used by God in conjunction with you belonging to a local church uh, to grow you and sanctify you in your faith. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at TBC? You can do that either through the app or you can go online to TBC Resources uh, and give there. Again, pray that this blesses you and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. Good morning, church. My name is Jeff Warner. I have served in the students' ministry for the last 15 years, and my wife and I are a host home for the young adults' practice group for the last two. Um, this morning's scripture will be 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Jeff. Well, I don't know if you pay attention to this kind of thing, but if you want to be popular here at the Village Church, I would get into student ministry and young adult ministry. Uh, they just, every time somebody from that ministry is a reader, the crowd goes nuts. And then other ministries, they're like, yeah, but that one, they, they're free in a way that we lost as we got crusty growing older. So uh, if you have your Bibles, this is our passage. Uh, and I'm eager to dive into it, just kind of going, I'm going to work through it line by line, but I want to frame it maybe differently um, than, than maybe you, you're framing it in your mind. Uh, I have had a probably single-minded obsession uh, for the last 20 plus years here as the pastor of the Village Church. I have been captivated by the biblical historical reality that the Holy Spirit can fall on a group of people in such a way as to transform a culture and, and, and drive out darkness and establish light. Like, I'm telling you, that's the thing that, that rocks me. It keeps me up. It makes me hungry. It makes me pray. It, it makes me want to, like, squab with the devil. Like, that's a driver in my life. And, and because if you were here in the early years, I mean, how often was I trying to point out what God did in Ephesus, that the Holy Spirit fell in such a way that the whole socioeconomic system turned on its head and the people who were making money from sinful gain actually rioted. Like, can you imagine an outpouring of the Holy Spirit where it was impossible to make money off of sinful gain because the people had repented and were turning their back on that wickedness? Can you imagine like a, a metroplex where there are no strip clubs, there's no illicit drug use, that there's a kind of pervasive righteousness that settles over the entirety of the city? That's what you saw happen in Ephesus. And so I read that, I'm like, yes, I want that in my day. That, that's not, you're not telling us that in the book because that's for yesteryear. Let, let's pray that in. Let's fight for that. Let's organize for that. Let, let's do that. that. That drives me. That idea that the kingdom of God is now, not later. It's here right now. And it's pushing back what's dark. And it's establishing what's light. And you and I have been invited into that is the kind of pervasive push in my guts. It's, the why, it's why I preach the way I do. It's why I'm not, as Wesley said, a velvet-mouthed preacher. I'm not trying to lecture up here. I, I'm trying to scream. I, I, I've got something to say that's not, here's a linear consideration for your, that's not what I'm doing up here. That's why there's not fill in the blank notes, nothing against that, just I, I'm, that's not why I think we've gathered. We've gathered so that the spirit of God might edify, encourage, and point us in this direction because I'm pulling all of this from the book. So let me show you, this is Jesus, he, he's Mark 1, so that's early in the gospel, right? Like Mark 1, that's early. Right, not midpoint like early, and he's doing these miracles, and he's, he's establishing that the kingdom of God is there. Every time Jesus does a miracle, he's showing you what the kingdom's like. Right? When he heals the sick, he's saying the kingdom drives out sickness. When he raises the dead, the kingdom has victory over death. When, when, he, when he calms the, the waters, he's showing you that the kingdom of God is at hand. And when Jesus comes, he comes preaching the gospel 
of the kingdom. He comes preaching um, that sin and death's reign is over, that it's on the clock and now it's only a matter of time before the whole universe sees it clearly. Here's Jesus. This is Mark 1, 14 through 15. Now, after John was arrested, John the Baptist, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. Now, what is the gospel of God? And saying, here it is, the time is fulfilled. So to the Old Testament, hey, the time is fulfilled. All the covenants, all the promises of God, all that God's been up to since day one for us. He doesn't have a day one, we have a day one. So the whole point of creation, the whole purpose that we're here, the time is now. It's fulfilled in what? That the kingdom of God is at hand. That means the kingdom is here. Not a future reality, a present reality. And you and I feel the tension of that because we're stuck in the already but not yet. You tracking with me? Like we're just stuck in the middle there. Like it, it's, uh, it's inaugurated but not consummated, right? It's, if you're a, a, a history buff, uh, Normandy's been taken, right? The beach has been taken. Now it's just a matter of time. Uh, once we had that stronghold there in Omaha and on those beaches, then it was over. It was just a matter of time. That's where we are. We still have a fight in front of us. And yet the beachhead has been set. And then later on, he, he explains how the kingdom works in this great I illustration where uh, the rulers didn't like Jesus. He, he threatened their money. He threatened their way of life. He threatened their, um, and they accused him of driving out demons by the power of demons. So he's casting out demons because that's what the kingdom does. It drives out darkness. And, and in order to try to make him lose credibility, they, they say it's by the power of Beelzebub, all right? The, the Lord of the flies. It's the power of demons that he drives out demons. And, um, and so Jesus has some things to say about that. Uh, that's not, by the way, a neutral question. Is it true that you cast out demons by the power of demons? That's fighting language, right? That, that's not, you're not asking a legitimate question there. You're, start, you're, you're trying to start something. And so Jesus answers their question, but we'll pick it up on what he says next. But if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And then he starts to talk about what the kingdom is like. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Now you might remember this when we were walking through the book of Revelation together, but this is what Jesus just said. That, that the principalities and powers of this present darkness, that's language from the book of Ephesians, the wickedness and darkness that's behind all the wickedness and darkness that you and I can see with our eyes have now been bound and what it thought it had is now ours to plunder. That's the kingdom. You should rejoice in that because if you're a Christian, you're part of that plunder, right? You were, you were according to Colossians, you were um, a, a in the domain of darkness until he transferred you to the kingdom of his beloved son. You were blind, but now you see. You were deaf, but now you hear. You were dead, but now you're alive. You and I are actually part of this plunder that the strong man has been bound and the kingdom moves forth through the people of God, pushing back darkness, ordering and establishing light and plundering from the enemy what he thinks is his. Every conversion, every bit of breakthrough from bondage, every baptism, every bit of repentance, every time someone moves forward and moves towards the grace of God, you're seeing plunder. And it's what you and I have been called to. And if we're not playing, then we're bored. And Christians should never be bored. Oh my gosh, we should never be bored. So um, here, here's a quote. I, I think it just provokes my Enneagram 8. I know some people think it's demonic. I think it's fine. So here we go. This is, this is uh, Michael Bird, but this kind of provokes my spirit. It's kind of how I'm wired. You, if you've been here a while, you know it. Satan's force is spent. His worst was no match for the best of the Son of God. The fatal wound of Jesus deals a fatal blow to death. It's my favorite sentence. The powers of this present darkness shiver as the looming tsunami of the kingdom of God draws ever nearer. This is Paul's atonement theology. This is the victory of God. Now, here's where you and I have a privileged point in human history. Like that, we're staring that in the face. You kidding me? This thing started in Jerusalem with a handful of marginalized, impoverished Jews. How do we get here? 2.68 billion Christians worldwide, no geographic center. Israel is not the geographic center of the Christian faith. We're all over the world. Brazil exploding, 
Asia exploding, Korea exploding, global south, parts of Africa exploding with the good news of the gospel. We're in Dallas as plunder from the strong man. All over the world, the gospel goes out. All over, light established, darkness pushed out. And yet, because, let's just do it, because we're Westerners, and I love Western Civ, but because we're sons and daughters, maybe grandchildren of the Enlightenment, you and I are actually living in the West in what I would call a Jesus-haunted reality. What I mean by that is all that the gospel gave us as it moved through the world that established good, true, and beautiful things are being exercised of Jesus and its biblical roots and made something wicked and demonic. And, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that as we move towards the topic. And if you're like, you haven't got to your topic. No, I have. This is just what fires me up about our topic. You with me? All right. So that's, that's all we're doing right now is telling you why I'm so animated, right? And, and so uh, now, now you've got this gospel. Like here, here's how, so uh, Ephesus blew my mind. And then, man, I started seeing these things as I was studying. Here was my, here was kind of a controlling question. Probably the first eight to 10 years I was pastor here. How, how does the Christian faith take over the world and must admit so much violence against it. Like here, the, the, num- the numbers are just historical fact. It's not, and, and I know facts are how you feel, but like if, if data actually is true, within 300 years of the ascension of Christ, 51% of the Roman empire calls Christ king. That's while they were burning us alive, while they were killing us in crowds, while they were, like, like where there was no gain to follow Christ unless Christ is resurrected and real. Right, like, like, how's this happen? Like, how does the, the darkest, most violent, most sexually perverse empire the world's ever seen? How does it get overcome by, by these people that, that don't have political power? They are very marginalized. They're predominantly poor. How, how does it happen? How do you overthrow an empire with quiet submission to the God of the Bible? So that that was my question, and here was what great. There are all sorts of, because it's true, it's historical fact, not fantasy, there are all these kind of first, second, third century writings where Rome is trying to figure out what the flip is going on. Who are these people? They thought we were cannibals. They, they thought we were, like they were very confused at what we were, that's why they tried to kill us, because if you're afraid of something, the best thing to do is attack it violently, apparently, and, um, and that was Rome's play. They were very confused by what we are, and so there are all these uh, first, second, third century documents where Rome's trying to figure us out. One is, um, one's from, you know it, you've read it, it's called the Epistle of Diognetes. I, listen, I know, I don't even need to quote this, right? I know you got that tat of it on your, right? I know, I get it. So uh, the Epistle of Diognetes was written uh, about 40 or 50 years out after the death of the Apostle John, right? The Apostle John uh, wrote the book of Revelation. It's in a time of immense persecution of the church, like a deadly persecution of the church. And, 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 and we find out, he, he clearly writes, what's happening? Why, despite Rome's best effort, lighting us on fire as torches, feeding us to animals for fun, plundering our property, putting us in jail, killing us wholesale, why it just kept growing. And so this is a paraphrase of it, and I'm, I'm, we're paraphrasing it for all our sakes. And here, let me, let me just read it to you. This is from the Epistle of Diognetes. By the way, you can find this online and enjoy the whole thing. This is just a paragraph. Let me tell you why Christianity is spreading so fast. Christians busy themselves on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. They live in their own native lands, but they live as aliens. For every foreign country is to them as their native land, and every native land is as their foreign country. Here's what I mean by a Christ-haunted moment in history. Up until this point in history, you were your ethnicity and you stayed there. You were your ethnicity, your ethnicity ruled the world, and you stayed there. You were born either into a class of ethnicity that was subjugated and enslaved, or you were born into an ethnicity that ruled and had power, period. You didn't mix them, you didn't mingle them up. That is a distinctively Christian movement in history. And he's saying here, here's what makes them distinct. They are Romans, they are Greeks, they are Jews, but they see themselves as that secondarily. They see themselves, first of all, as citizens of the kingdom. That their land is foreign 
and their foreign land is home. Do you hear it? Like they move towards one another. Now, here's what I mean by Christ haunted. So human rights, ethnic harmony, all these things that we're fighting for, they, they've been divorced of Christ and owned by a, a mentality that doesn't want to acknowledge Christ or acknowledge the boundaries or acknowledge the saving, saving forgiving work of Christ and made something altogether new. But you don't even have the language or the intellectual structure for ethnic harmony without the gospel slamming into a broken world. You don't have, that. it didn't exist. It was you were what you were. And that's why it was, we, it was hostile. Like we, these crazy, like what do you, how do you make sense of these people? Are they the black folk? No. Are they the white folk? Uh-uh. Brown folk? Uh-uh. Asian, it's all of them. All, it's just doesn't make, it's like blowing their mind. There was no category for it. And then he goes on, listen to this. They marry and have children but they do not kill unwanted babies. Now again, no, I mean, you can clap if you want, I'm, I'm here for it. This is a moment in human history where life is so cheap that it's hard for us to get our mind around. You had a baby girl, you didn't want that baby girl, it wasn't good to have a baby girl. It wasn't good to be a girl in this moment in history because when sin has its reign, women and children suffer the most. You could just take that girl, open up your front door, chuck her in the front yard and shut it. Christians came along with their Imago Dei theology and said, no, and grabbed those babies and started orphanages and churches were raising those girls. In fact, I read one guy tongue in cheek that explained the rapid growth of Christianity through the Roman Empire by saying all the girls were in the church. That's where all the ladies were, right? The church had adopted all these little baby girls and then those boys hit puberty and like, where are the ladies? Oh, church. And, uh, and some of you brothers in here, you know that right now because you're here because of that, right? <laughs> And, and then, like, don't, because we're, I'm already running behind. <laughs> so we've got this different view in an ethnicity. We have this different view on life, that it's valuable, that it's significant, that you've been made in the image of God. You're not a monkey or a dolphin. or a, you, you have value and worth beyond that. But then he goes on. They share their table with everyone, but they don't share their bed with everyone. A completely different standard of what sex is, how it works, and how God gave it to us for flourishing, right? To this day, if you go to places where there hasn't been a strong gospel presence, you will find red light districts given over to the culturally accepted practice of a husband having a side piece. I know it just got quiet because I know some of you are like, I don't think he can say side piece here. I don't, I don't think you're allowed to say that at church. But that... That, like I'm telling you, I'll be on a plane to the other side of the world just a couple of weeks from now, I'm eager for that. And the most heartbreaking, soul-crushing moment of that whole trip, the one that I won't be able to get off of me for a couple of months, is walking through a red light district and seeing the outcome of a perverse sexual belief system that would just make us bodies and not souls. But Christians came around and said, one man, one woman in the covenant relationship for life. Again, that, that's new stuff. That's, say what? One man, one woman for the rest of your life and covenant? You can get bored with that? I mean, that, I'm telling you, this was a different day, but we're haunted. It, like, like this is a Christian ethic that we're going to try to get rid of Jesus and get rid of, honestly, we're trying to get rid of the whole ethic. And I don't know that it's going well for it. It's making us foolish in our thinking. Like an 18-year-old girl would be like, man, I'd love to get married and have kids. I'm like, that, no, that's crazy. That is crazy. You work on your career, get, get to be 30 years old, and then when you've got your career established, then get married. 18-year-old girl, oh, man, I'd like to sell pictures of my naked body online and, and just give my most fertile years over to wild promiscuity. You can do that. Just don't get married. That's crazy. Do you see what's happened? Like, it, we bent our brains. But the ethic turned Rome on its head. No, 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 we're not participating in that. One man, one woman in a covenant for life. Then, listen to this, they love everyone. By the way, this is still my intro, I'm sorry. Um, they love everyone, but are persecuted by all. Now, this, this is here, this is where we're going. They are poor and make many rich. They are short of everything and yet have plenty of everything. He, he's speaking to, and there's a lot about this in, in other documents, that he's talking about in this moment how Christians would live radically below their means in order to live a kind of generosity that was odd to their moment in history. Right? So they have nothing. They've chosen to live way below their means. Why? So that they might be generous to all. And, and Diognese is like, hey, 
nobody does this. This is crazy. And then I'll finish out the quote. They are mocked and blessed in return. When they do good, they are attacked. When they are attacked, they rejoice as if been giving new life. You have to try this this week. Um, when you're mocked or attacked, you have to bless instead instead of hopping into a meme war and seeing how that thing plays out. I would just go, you get attacked, bless. You receive attack, rejoice, because they attack Jesus and all the prophets before you. It means you're probably doing something right. Now, now you could be a jerk, so I'd, I'd just ask some friends. If you're getting attacked for being a jerk, that's not, the Bible doesn't praise that. It calls you a jerk, right? And now here's, let me read you one more, and then I want to dive into where we're going. This is Aristides writing to Caesar Hadrian. Same question. Who are these people? What in the world's going on? They love one another, and he who has gives to him who has not without boasting. And when they see a stranger, they take him into their home and rejoice over him as a very brother. And if there is among them any that are poor and needy and they have no spare food, they fast two, three days in order to supply to the needy their lack of food. Listen to this. Such, O king, is their manner of life. And verily, this is a new people and there is something divine in the midst of them. How great is that? I love it. So um, each week, uh, we close our sermon, or, or we close our service. We're going to do it again today by reading a generosity prayer. We stand up and we read out loud, God, make us a generous people. That just kind of replaces, if you have a church background, that, that kind of, you grew up with the, the offertory prayer and song. Do you remember that? If you were Baptist, you know, it's the, the woman who sings real well, and she's got the mic, and when she touches the cord, it cues the track, and then she sings, and we pass uh, the plate, and you put your tithes and offerings in that. There's nothing wrong with that. that. That's worked for a long time. We just wanted to say a prayer together and cultivate over a long period of time the formation that would make us generous people. And and so uh, generosity is one of the primary markers that is visible in the people of God at the height of darkness fleeing. You tracking with me? So if you look across uh, Christian history and you look, when is the gospel really making inroads, really pushing things back, really establishing really beautiful things, the most consistent thing, I've been able to realize that they're like crazy generous, like a kind of crazy that the apostle Paul calls hilarious giving, right? It's hilaron is the, the Greek word here in a minute about cheerful. It's like be a hilarious giver. I don't even know what that is. It makes you sound crazy. But everywhere you look in history, the people of God have been marked when darkness is being pushed back radically by a crazy kind of generosity. And so with that said, I want to wake us up to that generosity. So to quote my man, Michael Byrd, in our day, the powers of this present darkness might shiver as the looming tsunami of the kingdom of God draws ever near. Let's look at this, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11. And, and I know some of you are panicking because you're like, oh my gosh, that was his intro. I, I promise you, it speeds up considerably. <laughs> Only one point with two, three subpoints. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. That's Paul quoting a psalm. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. This is simple. Here's the call. Here's the weight of the text. Be cheerful givers. That's it. And like I said, that, that word cheerful in the Greek is hilaron. It's where we get our word hilarious. Like, I've done a lot of work this week trying to figure out, like, what does it mean to be a hilarious giver? It, do you, like, look crazy? Like, <laughs> I mean, what, what, is it, what does it mean when you're not just giving, but you're hilariously giving, right? Um, that, that's his point. And he starts the text with this kind of universal principle that no matter what you believe about life can't be argued with. Whatever you sow, you reap. You sow a lot, you reap a lot. You sow a little, you reap a little. And this isn't talking about financial gain. There are charlatans who would take this text this way. They're liars and should be rejected. We'll talk more about that here in a second. 
Whatever you sow, you reap. You sow big, you'll reap big. You sow little, you reap little. It's just a universal principle. But, but here's the question I think we have to answer, the how of this. Like if he's saying, don't give reluctantly, right? So don't give because you know you should, so I better because I know I should, and don't give under compulsion, right? Don't let somebody play the strings of your heart. Don't look at Sarah McLaughlin singing with a puppy uh, and be like, oh, take my money. Don't do that. Don't give under compulsion. Don't give reluctantly. That's hard. Like that's, I don't know about, that's hard. I, I think if I'm real honest about my giving, specifically early on, when I started realizing my wallet was tied to my heart in ways I didn't like. Like it felt reluctant to me at first. And then there are times I felt manipulated to give. Like I felt my emotions were messed with so that I might give. And, and, and so how do we, if we're supposed to be hilarious givers, like how do we cultivate a heart that gives cheerfully, joyfully, hilariously without it being driven by reluctance or compulsion? Well, there's two things, and, and I'm just going to say the two things, and then we're going to dive in. Um, giving cheerfully or hilariously requires us to orient our hearts around what's true and to see all of our stuff for what it really is. You got me? How do we, how do we cultivate hilarious giving? I want to I I be hilarious. I, I want to have hilarious giving tendencies. I want to be hilariously generous. How do, how do I cultivate? How do I do that? Well, the first thing, it requires me to orient my heart rightly around God. So let me, let me just show you this. The only way, and I believe this, right? After 30 years of ministry, 21 with you, right? The only way you can really be cheerful giver is for you to know that God is generous and that everything you have is a gift from him, and especially that Jesus Christ, our great God and Savior, has come to give you his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. That The only way for us to cultivate cheerful giving is to remember and orient our lives around all that we have received, primarily, but not limited to, the life, death, resurrection, ascension of Christ, and the sending of the Spirit to let us walk in victorious living. Right now, let me show you the passage because the passage is insane. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. Listen to this. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Did you just hear this passage? Like you want to talk about the generosity of God. Here's what he just said. All grace. How much of it? All. How much grace does he have? Inexhaustible well. All grace, all sufficiency in all things at all times given to you. Are you kidding me? Like, listen, man, I know some of you. I know where you've been. I know what you're in right now. I know what I've been in. Here's, here's the generosity of God. All grace, all sufficiency at all times in every way given to you. When? This morning. Like, listen, when Lauren and I, seven years of tough marriage, all grace, all sufficiency at all times, and all, I'm looking around the room, Paul of you've been through it, all grace at all times, all sufficiency. I watched you walk through Maria, still in it, gut-wrenching, and he, and he sustains. And he, like, this is his generosity. He never runs out. You never out sin him. You never out screw him up. You, you can't do it. All grace at all times in all things with all sufficiency. I mean, there's a billion stories in this room that testifies that that's how generous he is. It's not just your salvation. It's sustaining you all the way home. And if you get that, you're like, oh my gosh, why wouldn't I give? Why, why wouldn't I like hand this to somebody else, this thing that I've been given? Why wouldn't I be gracious to others? The grace given to me is crazy. Do you see what he's trying? He's like, he's not after your wallet. He's after your heart. God don't need stuff. And then God's hands tied because you're stingy. No, you're robbing you and him. So he's trying to orient. He's like, no, 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 guys, hey, listen. All grace at all times, all sufficiency in all things, always for you, from me, just lavishing it more and more and more upon us. It's insane. The love of God is so hard to believe in our guts. I don't love people like that. I'm like the disciples, like, how many times I got to forgive a brother? 70 times, seven, what's the math on that? 70 times, Lauren, what's the math on that? Oh, bro, you just crossed the threshold, I'm done. That, that's me. 
That's not God towards me. That's me towards others. That, that exposes his holiness. All grace in every season, all sufficiency at all times. Goodness sakes, you're wealthy. If you're a Christian, you're unbelievably wealthy. And then he moves on from there and says, orient ourselves around how wealthy we are and then see all we have for what it is. Look, let's look at this together. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Those who think that they are not stewards and everything they have is theirs and not God's, they're unable and incapable of being cheerful in their giving or serving because they feel like something they own is being taken from them. So how about this? Let's use this illustration. I think it'll help. Um, so I walk around before service. I'm an extrovert that gives me energy. It doesn't take it. So if I, my throat's hanging in there, I'm, I'm meeting you. I want to know you. I want to meet real quick. And let's just say we met in the lobby this morning. So I, you, you got me out there before I came in here. And, and we're just having a quick conversation. I was like, hey, I, listen, I just, man, I was up early this morning praying. The Lord laid you on my heart. Here, here's what I got for you. You ready? I want to give you $5 million. Here's the check. You can cash it right now. You don't even have to wait. $5 million. But here's, here's the only thing I'm going to ask. I want you to spend some on you, like treat yourself, right? You like to hunt, get that Sitka gear you can't afford, right? You, you, you like essential oils, get you that crystal diffuser. I don't know, get, get you, remodel the house, spend some on yourself, right? Treat yourself. And then give the rest away for kingdom purposes. Like give it away, push back darkness with it, establish light with it, just give the rest away. You wouldn't be to me like, how dare you, sir? This is my money. No, it's not. I just gave it to you. Well, the argument here he's making is, hey, the seed for the bread, I did that, I give you this. So you're enjoying that bread in your mouth? That came from me. And, and how'd you get that bread to begin with? Me. There is no bread without seed, and I gave the seed. So the, the lesson in the scriptures and one of the more heinous accusations against God that we can make, one that exposes us as evil people, is to fail to acknowledge that everything we have is God's, from God, for his glory, and not our self-exaltation. And if you see your stuff like that, you see your time like that, you, you see your money like that, you see your uh, free time like that, you see your gifts like that, then that frees you up to cheerfully give what you have been given to steward. But the more it's your stuff that you got, that you made happen, that you, then, then you feel like somebody's trying to steal from you. And, and I'm just saying, I think you grow crusty. You grow crusty, angry, self-protectant, unhappy. But God, man, he wants you to be hilarious. <laughs> right? you, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm discovering something even as I preach. He, he, like, he wants you to be joyful <laughs> and give it away. And, and I want to highlight this. I mentioned it, but, but I want to highlight it. Um, the ROI on investing into the kingdom is guaranteed. Look at me. We got we to talk. And it's not necessarily financial. The Bible, nowhere I can find, says if you give money to the kingdom, you're going to get money in return. In fact, this passage tells you what your ROI is. Here, here we go. It, it says... You will be enriched in every way to, oh, I'm, I, I miss it. Let me get back up here. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase your harvest of what? Righteousness. What happens when you sow into the kingdom? You, you, you return, the return on your investment is righteousness, not saving faith. Not, not, you're not getting saved because you give to the kingdom. It's not that kind of righteousness. It's activated faith. Like it's saying there's something bigger than me. There's something more than this world. And I'm going to freely give to it because the ROI on that is my own faith growing. And according to the passage, it blesses others. It starts the faith in others. And I need you to know this because way too many times when churches talk about money, they tell the story of like, have you been, how many of you have been in church a while? I'm just saying a while. Well, a lot of times the money pastors will do this. It's not fun. It's not fair. Where they're like, and it's, it's true, it's happened, I've seen it happen, but it doesn't always happen where somebody's like, you know, I really felt like I needed to give and was wrestling with the Lord, but I, I remember, like, so, I, so I wrote the check and I gave it to the church and then 
oh my gosh, I had to write $2,582.36, put it in the plate. And I was like, Lord, I don't know how we're going to do this, this, and this. Uh, I just trust you to make provision. And I went up to the mailbox and guys, oh my gosh, I opened up the mailbox, opened up a, a random note from my aunt Sally. And she sent me $2,382.36. Praise his name. And everybody's like, woo! Maybe. Can I, take, can I tell you a little story of my house? So I, I confessed this actually to the congregation at um, Encounter. Um, it, it was the week before Encounter, and we just gathered to see what the Lord was up to. That, it, you know, Lauren and I, since we were young and poor, like poor, poor, like getting a fight because she drank all of Dr. Thunder without sharing it with me, poor. <laughs> That's the kind of poor we were. I'm fine. I got over it. I got over it. She just said it was the other way around, but I don't know. It doesn't sound like me, baby. Anyway, we'll talk about this at lunch. Like we had just said, no matter how poor we are, this is the percentage we're going to give away. We're going to tithe to whatever church we belong to. We're going to set aside a percentage of money to give to ministries we believe in. And then we wanted just a little, even when we were broke, broke, just a little paper to bless other people with. So look, that's budgeted stuff, right? This is how we're going to live. And somewhere over the years, I don't know how, I literally don't know how it happened. I prayed, I thought, caught, we've had conversations. Like I, I started making money through what the kids would call a side hustle. Just little things that I would piddle with. And, and man, I got income on that. And for whatever reason, I never tithed on that. I just saw that as just kind of mine. And I was out with the Lord. I do little retreats, just me and the Lord. And, and the Lord rebuked me in a real kind way about that. And, and so, man, I, I called some of my crew and confessed it, and, and then I confessed it to the people at Encounter, and, and then I, man, I wrote a, you know, a check kind of making up for my foolishness um, to the church, and then I went out to my mailbox and found out I had $20,000 in foundation repair that I needed to pay for. <laughs> right? that, that's what happened to me. That's my story. Oh, Aunt Sally didn't put nothing in the mail from that. <laughs> right? But, I, but here's what I got. Here's what I got. You ready? Look at me. The wrestle of faith. That's what I got. And that's better. I got the wrestle of faith. I'm your son. All things are yours. You own all things. I'm safe in your hand. I trust you. My clamoring and manipulating and maneuvering. No, I trust you. You're, you're my father. You're my king. I'm trusting you. I get that. That's the gift of righteousness. It's an ROI on investing in the kingdom. And when you give to kingdom initiatives, you participate in the righteousness that you've experienced. You know that all sufficiency and all grace at all times in every way? Yeah, you push that forward. Like you push that forward. You became a Christian because somewhere down the line, somebody decided to not get those new shoes and instead funnel money into the kingdom. You and I are products of the generosity of bygone era. And it's our turn, and it's a painful day to talk about this. One, um, the enemy's very successfully um, made churches not really talk a lot about money because some scoundrels that I mentioned earlier make, uh, like, you giving money to them some sort of spiritual, hey, this is what you get in return. If you give this, then your, your people will be healed. Or you give this, and I'll send you a napkin from glory that you can wipe around your house, and all the demons will leave nonsensical trash from charlatans. No, you get righteousness. And you get to extend righteousness for the thanksgiving and joy of others. Here's how Jesus is going to put it. Oh. Okay. It, Jesus is going to put it a certain way. But there are four types of people. This is fast, super fast. Four types of people when it comes to money. And this is important. There are righteous rich people. There are unrighteous rich people. There are righteous poor people and there are unrighteous poor people. A good friend of mine, a pastor, used that language all the time. I got it from him, it's not mine. Um, and what he was trying to do is attack what he would call a poverty theology, where the idea that if you're a Christian, you should be poor, uh, which it goes around. And you've got the prosperity gospel that's trash, and you've got the poverty gospel, and it's trash. No, we are what we are. There are unrighteous wealthy people, there are righteous wealthy people, there are unrighteous poor people, and there are righteous poor people. Our socioeconomic status is not an indication of how God feels about us in regards to blessing or curse, okay? And so, like, if you think about it biblically, you've got guys and gals in the Bible who are righteously wealthy. So I think of Lydia in Philippi. Lydia's a fashionista, man. She's got a house in Thyatira. She's got a house in Philippi. That's like Paris and New York. Killing it. Killing the game, right? And, 
and she encounters the gospel. She receives that sufficiency, that grace, all things at all times. And out of the abundance of that grace begins to see her wealth differently. And then you have the unrighteous wealthy. If you think of Zacchaeus uh, before he was converted, just a total schmuck, right? Just, just um, thieving, conniving, lying, manipulating to gain wealth. And when he becomes a Christian, he begins to move in the way of generosity. In fact, he gives money to everyone he had stolen from, right? That, that, that's how the gospel worked to make him a generous person. And then the Bible lets us know that there are um, righteous poor, Right, That they are not poor because they're in sin. They're not poor because God is punishing them. They love God. They serve God. They're faithful. They're just poor. Like, this is Jesus. Jesus is homeless. But then they're also, and this is Proverbs. Don't get mad at me. There are those who are poor because they're unrighteous. What does that mean? Well, the Proverbs lets us know. They're sluggards who won't work. Entitled sluggards who just won't work work. They won't hold on to a job. They drink away or gamble away their monies. They, you see in Proverbs that there are those that are always chasing fantasies and get, get rich quick seams and trying to leverage themselves in such a degree that perhaps they can strike it rich and then maybe even retire early, right? I'm not going to, I've already bagged on essential oils. I can't also bag on multi-level marketing. You don't divide the front on a week like this. You just pick one of them. I'm going to take the oil people and let's do it. We've been at it a while. Here's what Here's what Jesus says about money so you know his heart towards you. You ready? Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Listen to this. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Do you see what he's after? He's after your heart. Like I said, guys, he, in fact, in another um, Philippians 4, when, you know that verse that everybody pulls out of context, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? Like we make it about baseball or business. And, and really what Paul's talking about, if you read the context, is I've been poor and in prison and I stayed at Lydia's house. <laughs> I can do all things through Christ who gives me. I can be broke, broke, briggity broke, or I can have cash. I can do both through Christ who strengthens me. And then he goes on to thank them, the church at Philippi, for funding his ministry. And then he takes this turn and he says, but it was for you. It wasn't for me. It was for you that you gave. So Paul's argument is for the good of your own soul, don't be stingy. For the gladness of your own heart, for the joy that you might have in Christ and participating in the only story there is pushing back darkness, establishing light. Look to his beauty and grace. Loosen your hands and walk in generosity.